Hi, this is Rebecca Harvey, uh, Head of Talent Enablement for Clearwater Analytics. If you're wanting to learn how to embrace change and navigate through disruption as a leader, then listen to Leadership is Changing podcast with my good friend, Dennis Giannoutas. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Hey, welcome to the show, Leadership is Changing. What we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Leaders everywhere confront similar obstacles because people are people, but everywhere you go, leaders are overwhelmed, disrupted, and under pressure. They run from email to email, meeting to meeting. Many leaders are not changing quick enough, which means they run the risk of becoming irrelevant and being left behind. The purpose of the show is taking our listeners' leadership to another level by finding their balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. I believe we don't have enough effective leaders in the world today, and if we can get the leaders to step up and lead change, then they can inspire real change. Hey, listeners, it's now time to adapt in our fast-moving world. And listeners, I have a guest today. Her name is Rebecca Harvey, and uh, Rebecca is currently the Head of Talent Enablement for Clearwater Analytics. Rebecca has held executive-level positions in learning and development, and uh, and talent enablement at Microsoft, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and Hewlett Packard. And Rebecca has led teams as large as 300 people. And Rebecca has earned a PhD in education with a specialization in training and performance improvement in 2007, and has a number of professional passions, including diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the future of work, and the ever-evolving role of leaders in the context of those things. Hey, Rebecca, welcome to the show today. Thank you, Dennis. It's great to be here. Wonderful. Great to have you here. Hey, um, I've just given a brief introduction about you. Tell us a little bit more about your background. Sure. So when I talk about my career, I kind of always hear that one line from the Beatles song, The Long and Winding Road, right, playing in my head. My first job out of college was as a school picture photographer and as a territory sales rep. And so I kind of grew up in sales. So I I sort of fell into leading sales training programs almost by accident. Uh, Mm. I joke sometimes that uh, I got into sales training because I can write a complete sentence. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I earned a degree in English. One of the things that happened after doing some sales training was I moved into program management uh, during a period of major consolidation in the wireless telecom industry. So we went through six mergers and acquisitions in 18 months in the company that I I was working for, and I was a program manage- manager in that environment. After that, I shifted back into sales operations and marketing roles, where I really remained focused on learning and development and uh, enablement. I've really only been in HR for the past six years or so. Right, right, right. Okay. And so how did you actually get into leadership into leadership itself? Yeah. So, you know, the M&A work that I did as a program manager, um, it was incredibly rewarding. I never wanted to to be a people manager, right? I, I loved doing the uh, the program management, the relationship management. You know, I saw the, the thing I saw during that experience, though, was that the effects that good leaders could have on their teams and on culture and on developing, you know, other people in an M&A environment, there's always so many heightened emotions and, and so much conflict. I really saw how good managers were able to navigate that. And unfortunately, I also saw the reverse. So, you know, when an opportunity came up to build a team of my own sort of from the ground up, uh, I really leapt at that chance. And I've never looked back. I've had a, oh. I've had a great time managing teams and, and developing other people. Yeah, isn't it awesome um, to, you know, to experience that, especially the merger and acquisition side of things and that. But then the other side is people, right? And mm-hmm. for me, it sounds like from your, you know, from what you're sharing so far is there's that passion to work with people, build relationships and that. But then the other side, life will be so much simpler without people as well, I think. And um, 
And with a lot of leaders, you know, today, they, they do struggle. And a lot of them, you know, sort of, as I said, go from email to email, meeting to meeting, they do struggle and they're overwhelmed and they come across as really quite cranky or don't mm-hmm. look after the people very well at all. Um, yeah, so it's interesting to see that. Hey, Rebecca, in your in the introduction I, I, I did for you, there is what we talk about, your passion, including diversity, equity, and inclusion, and so forth. How important is diversity? I think it is it, it is absolutely critical. It, you know, the, the leadership is changing is the title of your podcast. And I think the the ways that leadership is changing are really being driven by what's happening in the world today mm-hmm. around division, uh, equity, inclusion, and the, the recognition that uh, the world isn't what it should be in a lot of those areas. I have a, a special needs daughter who's on the autism spectrum, and I, I look at the experiences around neurodiversity in particular. You know, we, we tend to think about race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, mm. sexual orientation, orientation, sort of those as the, the main categories of diversity. And, you know, I've really come to understand neurodiversity is a huge part of that. One of the really interesting things uh, that happened to me recently, I was in a class and I was sitting with a, a group of people who were talking about diversity in their in their group. And, you know, one gentleman said, I, I grew up in, in San Jose. I, you know, started work at a uh, Silicon Valley company. You know, I sit around a table like this and it's nothing but diversity right in in the group that he was in he said but from a thought perspective all of the people at that table whether they were asian black whatever they went to stanford harvard yale there was no diversity of thought (laughs) right? right because they all came from very similar life experiences and I thought that was a really interesting perspective to bring to the table because if you if you just think about diversity diversity in terms of gender or ethnicity you're missing a huge piece of that uh, that spectrum right okay and so what 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 do you think companies should do to sort of pick up the rest of that spectrum what what, what else should they do yeah, so I think there's a, a few key things that they can do that that a lot of companies are already doing in terms of hiring, right? Not just looking for talent from specific colleges or universities, not just looking for male or female talent, really trying to, to bring in a, a broad uh, group and broad representation from the, the broader uh, community. The other thing that I think is on leaders less than it is on companies mm-hmm. is to push themselves to have diverse teams, right? right? I, and diversity in, in many forms, not just mm-hmm. ethnicity or gender, right? And, you know, there's studies that show that that sort of diversity is, um, it, it doesn't feel good because you're not in a, um, you're not in an environment where people are like you. Right? right. And so it always feels like the work is harder, but the outcomes are better. Right. Mm. And so mm. I think I think leaders have an obligation to, to really think about who is it that I'm putting on this project team or who is it that I'm bringing into my own team and what are the different perspectives that they will bring that will right. help us be better. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think it'd be a rich experience for both uh, the individuals, but also for the leaders as well, by the sounds of it, if they if they do go down that track and, and think about things a little bit more. But I mean, that's probably a novel idea, probably for a lot of leaders is to take time out to think. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that'd be pretty cool for them to do that. Yeah, because there's there's such a like bias uh, in leadership, right? If you if you have a team of people and you know you have a project that needs to get done, you tend to hand it off to the people who are like you because you you have a higher degree of trust that they're going to get the job done. And I think we have to take a step back from that as leaders and say, okay, is this project something that I would struggle with? If so, then handing it to somebody who would handle it like I would is probably not the right solution. <laughs> no, probably right? get the same result. Yeah, I would, they would probably get the same result. They would probably have the same frustrations that I would have, right? So, really thinking about the problem and who is the best suited person to solve that problem. If I need somebody who's deeply analytical because it's a deeply analytical problem, I'm not going to pick somebody like me. <laughs> Yeah, and do you, do you think it's uh, for a leader to be able to go and do that? Uh, that's quite bold, and they'll have to have courage sometimes to be able to do that. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. And they have yeah. to know their teams, right? If you don't know your team and you don't know the strengths of the people on your team or even the strengths of people outside of your team that you could bring in, you're going to fail, right? You have to know your people and their strengths. There you go, leaders. There's the challenge. You've got to know your team. You've got to know others outside of your team and their strengths and bring that into your team and, or even to projects, initiatives and things like that. But, you know, be bold. Have the courage to be able to go out and do that, which is wonderful what Rebecca is sharing here with us today. Rebecca, a question for you now is um, who is your favourite leader? Now, this person could be alive or could be from history. So who is your favourite leader and why? You know, there's there's so many great leaders that I have uh, I've had the pleasure of working for. So I'm not going to pick one. I will I will choose somebody from history. I I would say Eleanor Roosevelt. So for your listeners who may not know who she was, um, she was married to the U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt during the war years. She was a political powerhouse in her own right, though. Uh, she became the first U.S. delegate to the United Nations after she lobbied hard for the U.S. to join the U.N. She was a tireless advocate throughout her life for civil rights, women's rights, rights of refugees, did a ton of work around uh, refugee resettlement after World War II. Just an amazing, an amazing woman. Yeah, so it sounds like a person who, um, you know, from history, fantastic and, and lobbied, pushed believed in something very strongly and actually pushed for it to happen. I mean, when it did happen, also had to then lead it and and step up and do that too. So that, mm-hmm. that's a wonderful trait to have and to see that being done. I think a lot of leaders complain. They they go on about things, but they don't actually push for it. Yes. They don't actually step up for it. And um, that's not leadership, is it? No. <laughs> no? No. <laughs> yeah. So the next question, you sort of answered it just before as well, which is the show is Leadership is Changing. That's the title. What else does that mean for you? You know, if if I tie uh, what you just said about Eleanor Roosevelt and pushing yeah. for what she believes in, I, I do think that the the situation that we find ourselves in with with COVID nineteen, with um, the equity issues that we see in the world today, I think leaders truly have to stand up and put their money where their mouth is. Right. Right. They right. They, they have to stand for equity and inclusion. They have to stand for belonging. They have to stand for the power and strength of their teams. And and they have to be willing to recognize that not everybody's going to disagree uh, agree with them, right? I look at uh, Satya Nadella from, from Microsoft and, you know, his, his focus on diversity, inclusion, and belonging is just exemplary in the market, mm. right? And you know there are customers of Microsoft who clearly don't agree with that stance. He doesn't care, right? Yep. <laughs> that's that's the company he's running, and that's the work that they're doing, and that's that's what he's that's what he's here for, hmm. right? At least he's got a stance. At least he knows what he's standing for and what he wants the company to stand for. Yeah, absolutely. If you look about you know AI and the work that's happening around artificial intelligence, Microsoft was one of the first companies to to stand yep. up and say we need diversity in our software developers. Otherwise, we end up with you know facial recognition technology that doesn't recognize every face in the world. Sure, right? <laughs> it sure. recognizes only a certain spectrum of faces. And what happens with those leaders who don't want to go down that way? What happens to those leaders who think, no, I'm quite happy just doing what I'm doing? I think as uh, as the industry changes, as we get more uh, generations in the workforce, Gen Z and millennials are going to force CEOs and leaders to, to take a stand, right? right. They, are, they are look, you know, I'm not a huge fan of generational research, but In general, if we're going to talk in generalities, right, in general, there's a higher level of interest and desire in making the world a better place. Yep. Yep. Sure is. Yeah, for sure. Now you've just sort of, that's a great sort of segue because you just talked about industry changes. So how has your business or industry changed and what sort of impact or demand has that put on you yeah, I think, um, you know, it's kind of funny with, with COVID-19, one of our leaders uh, a week or so ago was saying that, um, you know, our COVID-19 is our chief innovation officer. So, <laughs> which nice. uh, to some extent, I think is a reasonable assessment, right? So jobs that we once said uh, couldn't be remote, uh, those jobs are still getting done and they're getting done well, right? We, we uh, ended up 
sending almost a thousand employees home over two days. And we're not unique in that. Other companies have done the same thing. You know, work that was not expected to be able to be as people who were not expected to be as productive uh, remotely are being super productive remotely, mm-hmm. right? Jobs that we feel people have figured out how to collaborate through Zoom, Zoom and Teams and other yep. other media, right? I think there's a there's just a a huge need for leaders to you know lead with empathy, lead with um, you know resiliency, to be flexible, uh, have a very high degree of trust. All of those. All of those things, I think, come into play. Yeah, very good. And and what I've noticed, that I'm not sure part of your part of the world, but this part of the world, we we had the the first part of the COVID nineteen, the first lockdown mm-hmm. that sort of lasted five weeks, and then we sort of went through the levels and slowly came out of it over an eight week period. And for a lot of it, the leaders were, as you said, got out there, got people underway. But then what they noticed was the fact that week two, they realised they forgot to look after themselves. Mm-hmm. And then, and then, so that was quite hard. And then the other thing was for some of these leaders, uh, we went through a second wave, and the second wave was not big, Rebecca. It was very small. We're talking about a cluster of possibly a hundred people, if that. And um, you know, and so it was really, really small. But it sort of contained within a few weeks and a couple of weeks, two, two or three weeks. But we went into another lockdown, but not as severe in the sense as the first one in the levels. But what we noticed was that the leaders struggled on the second wave lockdown. Mm-hmm. And they struggled from the sense of they were emotionally tired. Sure. They had they were trying to look after their teams and pump everybody up and keep going, things like that. But when they had to go and do it the second time, mm-hmm. they just really found it hard. And mm-hmm. even now coming back, coming out of it and then coming back in the workplace, leaders are struggling. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know, have you seen that in your part of the world? Is, is that happening too? Yeah. So uh, f- for us, at least, we haven't had that dip of where we went back, right? So we have been, since March, we have been uh, remote, fully remote. But yes, there have been the the ebbs and flows of, yeah. uh, you know, there, were, there was a ton of almost, almost excitement initially, mm-hmm. right? Of uh, we're going to have virtual coffee hours. We're going to have, um, you know, game nights. We're going to do, you know, all of these sort of fun things to try to keep that team together, even in teams that didn't do that sort of thing normally. <laughs> and some teams even said they feel more connected now uh, than they did before, right? right? Because we are taking into consideration, you know, the global time zones of our employees. We are looking at, uh, you know, what's what's real for them. You know, it's not unusual at all. And I, it's uh, frankly, one of the things I love about uh, having team meetings, et cetera, is seeing kids pile in on, you know, mom's lap because they've just woken up from a nap yeah. or, uh, you know, saying I have to stop and let my dog out or, you know, these things that make us human and, and make our lives more bearable. We're getting to see those in a way that we never got to see those before as leaders, Right. We're also getting to see the effects of people who may live alone, who may be struggling in some way, right? Yeah. And the need to be able to recognize that and have meaningful conversations about that and let them know that they're not alone. Those things are, I think those are an invaluable part of what's happening right now. Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing the human side of leadership, if we can put it that way. So we're totally seeing that for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Hey, if there was if there was one thing that you could change a business as leader today, what would that one thing be? I think it would have to be transparency. Right. I think I think there's so many leaders who feel like they either have to tout the party line all the time, or they have to make appearances that that they are not struggling in this environment that they have to be the strong ones. I, I think to be an authentic leader, you just have to be transparent. Right. And there's there's nothing wrong with saying, I may not personally agree with this decision. We're going to get on board and we're all going to drive it anyway, because we don't have all the facts. We don't. I was listening to uh, Don Robertson talk uh, the other day on your podcast, right, uh, about that, that that leaders have a visibility. Executive leaders have a visibility to what's happening in the company that you know, people downstream from that may not fully understand. They may not have all of the all of the details. 
But I think it's it's absolutely appropriate for a leader to say, hey, I don't have all the information. And without that, I have a level of discomfort, but we are still marching forward. We trust our leaders that they're making the right decisions for all of us, right? And But, but I do think tra- that transparency is a critical thing that needs to change for leaders. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So being transparent, being authentic, and probably even add another word in there too, possibly as being vulnerable yes. and having that vulnerability side of things as well. And um, I think it's ideal if we can do that too, because then that's where people see that, you know, you are a human being, going back to that human, mm-hmm. the human side of leadership side of things. Uh, I think that's really important for sure. When I think about the best leaders that I've worked for, yeah. they have they have all exhibited those traits, right? Mm. You know, they, they can quickly move from here's my authentic view to here's what we're going to do to drive forward, right? Right. Yep. Yep. And sorry, those leaders, um, Rebecca was going to actually mention you earlier on in that first question about your favorite leader, but she was really thinking about <laughs> you as well. <laughs> so that's all good. But you're right. I mean, we all know leaders who do it and demonstrate it well. And they've been, the, as you, those words you just used, those favorite leaders, the, the best leaders mm-hmm. that we've had and have experienced. And then on the flip side of that, we, we know those leaders who don't do mm-hmm. that. And they're the, sometimes the worst leaders we've mm-hmm. worked for. But also that's been an experience too, a learning for sure. us. That's that's something whereby I don't know about you, but I always can look at different leaders and go, Yeah, I love those traits mm-hmm. and I, that's the things I would like to do. And there's others I look at and I go, Oh mm-hmm. yeah, I don't want to do what they they've been absolutely. doing. But it's a great learning sure. for me, right? I I have to learn yeah. from that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Uh this question could be an interesting one. And that kind of goes along more about the employees. How has the employees' expectations of leaders changed? I think employee expectations have changed dramatically. Again, as uh, as demographics of the workforce have changed, as you don't have sort of these, mm-hmm. you know, early in my career, we talked about sort of hostage employees. These were the employees who were right. near the end of their career. There really wasn't anything else for them to do. So they were sort of a hostage to the company. You know, the the... The number of millennials and Gen Z uh, employees in the workforce today, they are not hostages and they refuse to be hostage, right? They will go and find something else. They will go and do something else. They expect transparency. They expect honesty, right? The the BS detector (laughs) in (laughs) in digital natives is so high, right? They... They see through spin like nobody's business, yeah. right? And yeah. so I think they expect us to be honest and authentic and transparent. And they expect us to be open about what we're what we're doing as a company, where we're heading as a company, where we stand yeah. for things that are happening in the world. Sure. Yeah. I think those expectations have changed pretty dramatically. Yeah, and that technical term you use, the BS te- mm-hmm. detector, I think it is so strong nowadays, and it's like as if they're born with it, and they they just and and they can see, as you say, they can see right through you. And there are leaders who still continue to go down that track, and I'm like, come on, pal, you've got to wake up. I mean, that's just not the right oh, way. It's right? the most frustrating thing, you know. the 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 minute mm-hmm. I hear somebody say something that is just it's just spin, and we have to, you know, we this idea that we have to sell this. We're not going to sell it. Nobody's buying. <laughs> no, <laughs> right? No, and I and, and I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that uh, leaders try to be everything mm-hmm. to everybody, and they feel like they have to have all the answers. And as you said, you don't have to have all the answers. You may mm-hmm. not know, and that's okay. Um, and say so. But then, what's not okay is that people don't follow up with people and come back to them with the answer because that's what there's a gap. And if you don't mm-hmm. close that gap. People will make yes, things up. Yes, yes. And I, th- I, I honestly do think it starts with vision, though. If you can get people, right. any employee from any generation, if you can get them on board with the vision, and then you can connect whatever it is you're doing, whatever decision's been made, whatever is happening, if you can, can connect that to the vision and the roadmap of what's going to get us there, you get a whole lot more credibility. And, and you get a lot more willingness to to yeah. sort of accept the gray areas and, okay, maybe we don't know every answer, but I can see how this is taking us 
to that next level, right? To that next step on yeah, the journey. I love, yeah, I love that. I love that. Connect the vision and the roadmap. And then that's where you'll get the buy-in mm -hmm. from the actual employees and actually the leadership team. They, they'll buy into it more and that's where they'll they'll believe in it. And, go and a higher well. degree of tolerance to ambiguity, which we oh. don't, you know, when, when your BS radar is high, ambiguity sometimes feels uncomfortable and but if you understand the vision and the roadmap you're you are willing to, your acceptance of that ambiguity is a little higher i think yeah that's great yeah good oh, i like that <laughs> wow okay hey here's a question which is what do you in your view what or your opinion what what is your what do you think makes a leader successful today in the fast-paced ever-changing world uh, I think what I just said, um, vision is a key thing. You, you got to know where you're going and, and what it's going to take to get there. Two other things I would list, honesty. You, you have to be honest about what you're feeling, where the company's going, all of those things, and trust. You absolutely have to trust your team, right? If, if you don't mm -hmm. have that degree of trust, if you're constantly looking over their shoulder, one, your life is going to be miserable, but two, they're not going to feel like they can do their best work. And ultimately, that goes back to diversion, uh, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, right? If, if, if I'm always feeling like my leader doesn't trust me to do my job, I'm not going to do the best job that I possibly can, right? So no, I, no. For, for me, those three things, vision, honesty, and trust are uh, what it comes down to. Nice. Sounds like that's how you can set people up for mm -hmm. success. If you have a vision as a leader and uh, take them in and get them to buy into that and then have honesty and trust and trust your extra team members to go out and do the best that they, they can do. And that's that's why you employ them. That's why you brought them yeah, on board, absolutely. right? So uh, give them give them yeah, give them the environment to go be able to go and do that, which is which yep. is great. Yeah, cool. Hey, um, so I'm gonna ask you to get your crystal ball <laughs> out now and, and we're gonna start thinking about the future here. Where do you see leadership being in five years from now? I think we're going to see our definitions of leadership changing um, pretty dramatically. I think we're going to recognize that leaders, and to some extent we already do, right? We recognize that leadership happens at every level of an organization and it has to. But I do think that uh, we're going to see opportunities for leadership um, mm -hmm. a and expanding, right? I see like leadership development programs. I see the the thinking around those changing pretty dramatically to be instead of just tapping pe people on the shoulder and saying, hey, we think you're a high potential, having those being opt-in programs where people can say, hey, I think I have high potential. What right. can the company do for me? What can I do for the company to help drive that, to, to help uh, develop myself? Um, that sort of self-development side of leadership I think is going to be a really key thing uh, over the next five, six years. Yeah, that's, that's actually quite a good point. It actually goes back to your, one of your very first points about the the diversity thing, right? So this is that where people may want to include themselves mm -hmm. into it. And and I, I've i seen and you've seen over the years where a lot of these high potential top talent programs, a lot of it is I've gone into the rooms to, to facilitate and I look at people and I go, oh boy, oh dear, is that our, is that the top talent? how did they get here? And for a lot of it is because they know somebody or their boss wants to look after them, things like that, which is great. But it may not always be for the best of the interest of the organization or the individual itself. So I think the, yeah. I, I was just going to say, they, they get there because of like bias, right? Right, exactly. They there get you go. there because yeah. someone is like me, therefore I, I'm a leader, therefore they should be a leader as well. Um, I'll tell you two really quick stories. One, I had a, a VP who actually left a company because he went to a high potential development program and looked around the room and right. said the same thing that you did. If this is our company's best talent, I, I don't belong here, right? Not because he was threatened or inhibited by them or intimidated by them, but because he didn't, he didn't think that he didn't agree that this was the top talent of the company. The other was I was working with a CTO at one point and he said, listen, I don't want an HR hypo program. Right. I, I don't want right. you to give me people who are already doing everything right. I want you to give me, you know, I want the people who are the diamonds in the rough, who may uh, tick people off, who may not always say the right thing or do the right thing, because those are the people that I can polish. And th they're in the long run, they are going to be better 
than anybody that you would give, give me who's quote unquote a hypo, right? So I do see those, I, I see that being a, a, a pretty big uh, change in how we think about yeah, leadership. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, definitely huge. Uh, I think, um, you know, the first person you talked about, the vice president, and then leaving, I think it's also about being in a room whereby you don't want to be the smartest in the room. You want to be in a room whereby you are going to be challenged yes. and stretched and grow, for sure. And number two, I, I, I love the other one about the diamonds in the rough mm -hmm. right, and being able to polish and, and get that. And I think they will become the strongest advocates because of the fact of where they've yes. come from, what they've gone through to get where they need to go to. And I think that's really great. So self-leadership and, and then the, the like bias for sure. Yeah, definitely. So team, um, I think listeners, if you're, if you're thinking about leadership going forward in the next five years, based on what Rebecca's talking about, it's about the definition of leadership will change. However, a lot of it's going to come down to self-development. And, and Rebecca, what, what should people do if they're going to start thinking about self-development? Because I, I know that a lot of, lot of people in life go, oh, what's the company going to do mm -hmm. for me? And uh, and I think if we think about self development, possibly that's not going to be the right thing to be thinking about. What well, what should people do to help themselves around self development? I think you have to figure out where you have gaps um, as a leader, as an individual, even as an individual contributor, and you want to become a leader. You have to look at where you have gaps and work and, and right. develop a plan to close those gaps. Right? Whether it's through reading, yeah. whether it's through mentorship, whether it's through taking online courses. There's a variety of ways that you can develop yourself, but if you, and and that frankly is where it comes down to sort of self-sufficiency and being self-directed. If you say, I'd like to do this, and then you never do anything about it, going back to the Eleanor Roosevelt point, right? You have to put your money where your mouth is, which is why I think the, the notion of opt in to hypo programs is really compelling because the people who do the work Right. The people who put in the time, you're going to see them yep. versus just tapping somebody who's like you on the shoulder. And th they may be a great performer. They may truly be top talent, but their reaction is going to be one of, oh, no, one more thing I have to do. Right. You risk burning yep. them out. So I, I think this this stepping away from this notion of we get to pick who the next leaders are. I, I think that has to go away. Yep, yep. And I always say, I hear a terminology sometimes being used where the cream rises to the <laughs> top. And I think whereby if we allow people to do that self-development and allow them and then they rise to the top, then let's just see what comes out of that. Because we, based on our light mm -hmm. biases, as you're saying, we may think that somebody is a great leader, but then there might be someone just beside them somewhere else, totally in a different area, different team that we bring in. And you just yeah. watch them fly. I mean, that that's that's the beautiful thing about seeing it and it is beautiful it to is watch beautiful it happen to watch it happen absolutely absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah excellent hey that's that's fantastic um i like it put your money where your <laughs> mouth is um that's it team so if you want to develop as a leader that's what you need to do and it literally means that too i mean for a lot of people they think the organization will do things for them as i said before but you know over the years and i'm sure rebecca you've done the same thing too i've i've spent money mm -hmm. on myself invested in myself to develop myself and i i think that's that's having to put the mm -hmm. money um, where my mouth is to get on with it, right? And so, yeah, team, definitely developing yourselves. And, of course, one one great way to do that is listen to podcasts as you're listening to this episode or this show. Uh, it's a great way of doing it as well. Hey, Rebecca, thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, if our listeners are wanting to get hold of you, how, where should they go? Yeah, the best way is uh, Rebecca Harvey One on uh, LinkedIn. On LinkedIn, yeah, great. So Rebecca Harvey won on LinkedIn, and uh, we'll get them to the show notes as well. So Rebecca, once again, thanks very much for being on the show today. Thank you. Hey, what we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Change is incredibly scary, especially with the unknown, the unfamiliar territory. It is time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing. Hey, listeners, look out for the episodes as they're being released. Download them, have a listen, put a review, a rating, and share them with your friends, your family, your network. Hey, if there's any feedback you'd like to give me on the show, or if there's a question you'd like me to ask my guests, or if there is a question you want to ask me ask on the Ask Dennis uh, freestyle episode that happens once a week, then feel free to send me an email, dennis at leadingchangepartners.com. 
team, just a reminder for you to go and join the Leadership is Changing Facebook group that we have on Facebook. And uh, that is a community for leaders to get together and talk about leadership cha- is changing. So feel free to join us on that. Hey, listeners, great to be have you on the show today. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk again soon. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast-moving world.